You know what I was thinking about today? Huh? Uh, how the sunburn on the right side of my face <laughs> makes me look like I am an older man having a midlife crisis at a golf course. <laughs> it's not too far off because I feel like you're a mid 20 year old woman having a midlife crisis. Sometimes but at, not a at a golf course. course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sometimes at a golf course, most often on a pickleball court. Oh, no. See, there you go. Sport. For those of you at home who cannot see me, in other words, all of you, all of you. I, have, <laughs> um, I have a really heavy sunburn on the right side of my face because I was out in the sun this past weekend. And it's ending right at my hairline, which makes it look like somebody gave me a really bad spray tan on it one does. side of my face. It's, it's like the ones um, that I would get from our marching band hats that for some reason flipped up on one side. So I just have like this one like triangle of my forehead just be completely burnt red. <laughs> for the listeners, Caitlin is Irish and Scottish. Guess what I look like. <laughs> <laughs> so she has very, very sensitive skin to the sun. And I'll never forget when you and I in high school were at like an event where we were volunteering with elementary oh, school. No. <laughs> and you had a horrible burn from your, I think, ballet flats or moccasins that you've been wearing. Yep. And you still have the line from that. It's been eight years. Still to this day, my feet are discolored for sure. <laughs> 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 Wear sunscreen. <laughs> Caitlin understands better than anyone the the white and red thematics Truly. of Good Omens, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. which is what we're talking about today. It's Good Omens time, baby. It's back. It's only been four years, not that anyone was counting, but they're back, baby. Whee! It was me. I was the counter. It's crazy. It's crazy how long it took for us to get to this point. It's definitely one of those things where there was a whole pandemic in between season one and season two, and then a lot of investments in FX for this show, mm -hmm. which all look awesome. And then, of course, that I think Neil Gaiman has a propensity to keep his public waiting. <laughs> Man loves to torture. <laughs> I saw a, a post the other day that said that Neil Gaiman is essentially on Tumblr, uh, yeah. the troubled king of a medieval court <laughs> that is watching his subjects uh, kind of divulge into disarray. Um, and I thought that was really funny. That is so exactly accurate. It. That is complete. I love that he's on Tumblr and that he like engages a lot on tumblr or like he just like pops up even when he's not even like it's not about him he's just there and he'll like he's just there he'll add something we'll be like oh cool thanks neil gaiman oh thanks neil gaiman <laughs> thanks for your input babe so caitlin mm -hmm. let's start with your initial reactions to this season i'd like to hear what you thought okay if you put a gun to my head and told me that i had to tell you what the plot was of this season you would have to pull the trigger because <laughs> oh, it's really nice knowing you caitlin <laughs> <laughs> like I I enjoyed it don't get me wrong I I had a great time when I was you know watching it um but I literally am coming fresh off of it I watched all of season two today and I think that I just need to not binge this show because I think so much happens that mm -hmm. I can't quite grasp it all and so my brain just like will tune in and out when like the seemingly important things will happen and I'll be like okay now I'm paying attention and when like something else happens where I go mm, I know it's fine if I tune out for a bit it, it goes off it was interesting to me because like obviously the first episode is all set up and you have the problem of Archangel Gabriel not knowing who he is or where he is or who anybody is and I'm like oh this is interesting like what's going on I just kept wanting to like get that answer and then to me it felt like all you need is like the first episode and then the last episode because the last episode's like yeah sure here's what happens and then <laughs> gives you everything so it, it was just like four episodes in between a fun little flashback type things it's a fun show to me it's very colorful it's very fun the music really like makes me happy but it's this isn't the show where I'm just like I need to pay attention to every single thing that happens I'm just like mm. it was on and I was there and had a fun time <laughs> <laughs> and now you're not going to be here anymore because we need to put a gun to your yeah, head yeah sorry Caitlin, guys when you die will you will me your plants are you gonna take care of them uh no comment <laughs> okay um you might not be <laughs> willed my plans anymore sorry what did you think did you have a fun time yeah I did have a fun time I really like the 
ambiance of this show Mm -hmm. i feel like it kind of hits you like a warm hug in the way that many shows don't anymore it's very soft (laughs) you know yeah much softer than a lot of the stories that are being told right now and it's interesting to me because there's something wholesome contained in the subject matter that i feel like you really see anymore Mm -hmm. but it works like it's not it's not entirely vanilla like there are things you know (laughs) But I I think it works. If anyone's going to watch this show, I think you have to keep an open mind that, like, it really is a love letter to British sci-fi. It was very British. There are a lot of Whovian elements that (gasps) I cannot get over because I think it's hard to reproduce that balance of coyness and sentimentalism that shows run by, say, like, Russell T. Davies or Stephen Muffet have executed so well in the past. And when it happens, it works. While watching it, I'm like, I know it's not just because David Tennant is here, but, like, that's part of the reason why I, like, had such a good time because it brought me back to, like, the Doctor Who days of, like, watching that every weekend and just... I don't know it just makes me happy I'm like it's quirky fun silly times and it made me feel nostalgic even though this was a brand new season like it was really really nice exactly they do such a good job of recreating those feelings that I know like you and I probably had on a winter afternoon Mm -hmm. um, probably a snow day when we were both kids watching Doctor Who in your living room Mm -hmm. I think that it's it's done so well and I think it's totally intentional because you see over and over again, all of these callbacks to Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, like Beelzebub's fly that is gifted to Gabriel being bigger, bigger on the inside. inside. I like, I like uh, perked right up. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, me too. More. <laughs> me too. I bet a lot of people did that. Yeah. Um, I bet we'll be hearing that over the next couple of weeks. The bigger on the inside being like, like if, if we were both dogs, our ears would just go, Ooh. like, it's like, a, when we heard like that. we're sleeper agents and that was our trigger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the 14 year old Doctor Who fan in me was like, hello? We're back. We're back. What are we talking about? Where's my fez? Where's my bow tie? You, you, you'll see me pulling like an OJ Simpson in, in The Naked Gun where like someone steps on a watch and I'm just like, I must seek out damages against Stephen Muffet. I must seek out damages against Stephen Muffet. And I, like, start walking into the ocean. (laughs) They literally, like, played a TARDIS sound when they mentioned it in the show. Like, Doctor Who was mentioned. In the background, you can hear a faint TARDIS sound. And I literally, I I just started tearing up. I was like, oh, what a good time. (laughs) I didn't hear the TARDIS sound. I didn't hear the TARDIS sound. It was very faint in the background. I remember them mentioning Doctor Who and being like, "Mm, yep, Mm, thanks, thanks. Um, Which makes me think, like... Can you mention Doctor Who? I mean, you can because I did, but like the thought of them yeah. mentioning Doctor Who as a show in Good Omens with David Tennant as Crowley just sitting right there, I was like, hmm. Oh, right. What's show the me, lore there? What's your explanation? Like, is he just like a demon who took on somebody else's face? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. What's the implication? Is Did he play Doctor Who? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would believe that where he just had a brief sin where he's like hold on I gotta go become an actor real quick is Crowley David Tennant or is David Tennant Doctor Who remains to be seen the answer is um, yes we will not be finding out for another four years, four years. <laughs> so <laughs> a more pointed reference well actually I wouldn't say it's a pointed reference because I'm not even sure if it's a reference at all but it took me out it's in I think episode it's either episode one or episode two mm-hmm. when Crowley is talking and, and, and you hear David he goes well well <laughs> this man cannot say well or oh yes at all because he says oh yes at one point and i was like <laughs> i well. remember <laughs> that was a catchphrase <laughs> i was like yeah yeah it well. gave me such like a, a, a warm feeling in my tummy i was like yes. oh my god it makes me Call want that. like there's a specific tea that i would have it was like a lemon tea that i would have whenever i would like watch mm. doctor who or sherlock back in the day and I can't smell that tea without being transported back into that exact time period of it being like you said before, like a snowy day and you're just binging Doctor Who in the living room. Like it's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's such a, a nostalgia that it, this show does so well. And I feel like that's so rare with original content. Like, yeah. Because you're creating something that's all new and yet it somehow mimics, I think, our childhood specifically. I know we're both yes. speaking from personal experience, like to a T. And I think if I was still 16 year old 
nerdy Emberlin and not 25 year old nerdy Emberlin, <laughs> I would really value that deeply, mm-hmm. maybe more than I do now. I kind of like want to kick the sand, you know, and like <laughs> put my hands in my pockets and be like, oh man, oh, because man. I feel like some of that magic has gone out of my life in adulthood and I would really value the contributions of this show more uh, as a younger person. I was thinking that too. I was thinking like if this came out in like 2014. I'd be all over that I show. would be <laughs> all over it. I mean, the reason why I started watching this show was because of David Tennant. So, uh-huh. uh, I mean, that yeah. that's still with me. If, if he's in a show, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> but I just know that like I would be absolutely obsessed. I enjoy the show now, but I think I'm such a casual fan with this show that like younger me would be like, oh my God, look at all of these little details. And like, I'd be writing meta on Tumblr about it. Oh yeah. I would be doing snow angels in the meta tags on Tumblr, <laughs> just <angels>. sprawled out, <laughs> get, slowly contracting hypothermia. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. What were some of your favorite things about this show? Like watching it? Oh, well. As opposed to not watching the show. <laughs> definitely the watching it part. That was, definitely the part where my eyes fun. were open and I was paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, the TARDIS sound. I didn't notice. I want to talk about attention to detail and yeah, praise yeah, that. Yeah. This is definitely one of those shows. And I think this, to your point about streaming, this doesn't feel like the most bingeable show. It feels like you need to dissect it in small pieces. I think part of that is like, I feel like this one you need to watch over and over again. Like you need to yeah. watch the episodes multiple times to pick up on new things. And And I'm not criticizing that. I think that's awesome that every time you watch the show you'll see something new someone it seems is thinking of everything at all times like there are no starbucks coffee cups in this show you know just sitting out (laughs) just in the open (laughs) but more broadly i feel like you can see this with the costuming yep uh for example which is just oh my gosh uh incredible all of as and crawley's looks are so well thought out so detailed Mm -hmm. there's such intricate considerations for each character's personality and characterization um in episode three when they're on their little grave robber adventure i loved how az's white frock coat had more frills around the shoulders and upper body than Crowley's. Yeah, I loved all of their costumes from like every different time period. Every outfit was, I'm like, oh, that's so them. Of course they would wear that. <laughs> Literally, it, it's. I feel like it's one of the aspects uh, that really allows them to embody their characters. Like the softness and the delicateness of Aziraphale mm-hmm. versus like the, the cool, uh, repressed and like badass identity of Crowley. Mm-hmm. Um, and how it's how that especially is like a facade. How the glasses, for example, are a facade for like oh. somebody who's actually deeply codependent. And as we learn toward the end of this season, uh, very much in love. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had a <laughs> stimmed a little bit there, huh? <laughs> Just a little bit. Okay, you wow. you saying um, his glasses are a facade made me remember that Crowley's license plate is the word curtain backwards. What do you think that means? <gasps> Whoa. <laughs> Goddamn. <laughs> I like looking at the background of stuff for this show. Like, I was looking at the license plate and I was looking at the letters. I was like, well, that make, doesn't make any sense. I'm like, wait, this looks like a word. Oh, wait, this is curtain backwards. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure someone's got some meaning or someone's listening to it. It's like, here's here's what this could be. <laughs> like, That's great because I was just thinking as we were writing notes for this episode about how it seems like at the very end, and we'll talk about this more later on, mm-hmm. um, like Crowley is really pulling the curtain back when he Whoa! finally decides to talk. Um, oh. And I wonder, oh, wow. I wonder, I really want to, I would love to hear uh, some some meta writers interpretation yeah. of, of that great catch thank Jeez. you <laughs> thank you thank you another detail I like is and now this is the I had to take a music history course in college nerd in me but <laughs> the record that Aziraphale gets is Shostakovich's uh, Symphony Number no. Five in D minor which uh. was uh, it reflected a situation 
where as an artist he would be judged by politics as much as his talent this was like his response to being like judged for his politics and it was a reflection of like his feelings about everything that like a lot of the audience like really caught on to as a whole it makes me think of the Xerophel and how he is like like at the end how he gets like the job of that Gabriel had and how like he is kind of being judged in a way of like taking that position and wanting to do better and but also as a whole of like heaven and hell having these set rules of no like heaven does this and hell does this and we can't cross like you can't work well together like taking those politics and going against them does that make yeah. sense? Am I making sense? I've been like piecing it together for the past few hours and like to be like, hmm, what does it all yeah. mean? No, but I think that does make sense because as you started talking about this, an alternative interpretation came to me and that's that like Crowley is kind of waving off hell and its politics. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the season. So I feel like it definitely relates to the political dichotomy of both as and Crowley's, I guess, coping mechanism for managing the bureaucracy of right. hell and heaven. And I have more to say about that uh, in a little <laughs> bit, but I love that you noticed that. I think that yeah. that is so interesting. God, I love music theory. It felt intentional because they totally. showed the record. So I was like, <gasps> immediately totally. like trying to remember the things that I learned <laughs> about it. Also, like the role that music plays in the show should not be disregarded like right the use of gosh oh gosh that buddy holly song um yeah 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 versus the queen song last year is so crazy um i think there's a new formula now where shows realize that if you pick like one song that is memorable and you utilize that in a way that contributes to the plot meaningfully. I mean, first, it'll probably make you go viral right. during promotion. But also, I think it helps to build in a larger meaning. Yeah, and I think you have to be really careful with how you do it because I think it also has to do with how it's used outside of the work itself, like how many times you hear a song before going kind of insane. Yeah. And like I feel like this show does it well in a way where it uses it and it's part of the plot because it's just like what does it mean like where did he hear that what does the song mean what is it like what's going to happen to us i think a use where at first it starts off really really cool but then it gets to be too much is <laughs> kate bush is running up that hill in stranger things <laughs> which like it's so good it's so well used in the first half but then there was that break between part one and part two where everyone was just using running up that hill and then i yeah. believe they used it you hear it again in the show and i'm like okay how many times can i hear <laughs> yeah <laughs> no that's I go, a like, great insane. example i always wondered with the stranger things bit where they utilize it again in part two i wondered if there was something else they'd originally used and then they they saw how popular that edit had become from the first part part of me thinks no because it's established that Max is a huge Kate Bush fan. The right, very first. yeah. But then it's like, I don't know, use a, use a different Kate Bush song. I don't know. Because <laughs> when part two comes out, it's like, it feels like pandering. It's also like, they only had the rights to that one song and they <laughs> used it. <laughs> like, let's just keep using it over and over again. I think they should use library music next time. <laughs> yeah. We they should actually the use bridge. a theme song. <laughs> they know what's good for them. Well, that Buddy Holly song is another one that, like, you're right, it can be done right or wrong. And I think in the context of this show, it works because of, like, this show is very, like, sweet and soft and corny and it makes sense. But it, it made me laugh because I was watching this show last night and we're also watching Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhaney's Welcome to Wrexham documentary. And I think at some point during the season, the theme song becomes that song. Um, really? <laughs> yeah. And we watched that first. And then last night when I was watching this and the song came up again, Vishwas, who hasn't been watching the show with me, turned around and he was like, no shit. What a no coincidence. Shit. And it really is like, if I could think back in the number of times that specific song has been used to convey a point um, and evoke a certain feeling in shows, <laughs> if I had a nickel for that, I have two. <laughs> Something something Dr. Doofenshmirtz. I don't know. I something know. something Dr. Doofenshmirtz. I don't have the direct. Uh, that makes me think of every time I hear another piece of media use Red Right Hand by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, oh, which yeah. is the theme song to Peaky Blinders, 
which is uh, so ha-ha. great and perfect for Peaky Blinders. So when I hear it used in another show or like a movie or something, I'm just like, you can't do that. I'm sorry. Yeah. You can't use it. This is Peaky Blinders. <laughs> yeah, no, some shows definitely have a monopoly over the songs that they use. And for other right. shows to try to use those songs, it would just be off-putting. Speaking of, of music and sound mixing, another thing I liked is when the Nazis make it to hell, um, one of whom, speaking of Doctor Who, is Mark Gatiss. Matt Gatiss. Um, Mark Gatiss. That, Mark Gatiss. That... <laughs> I keep saying that his name is Matt, even though I have known his work for most of my formative years. Matt. <laughs> but when they make it to hell, uh, there's this horrible ear ringing. Uh, yeah. When they're sitting there, um, and the office is there, because, which I think is such a nice touch because it really sets the whole scene off kilter a little bit. It's very disturbing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, sound mixing is everything. I, I remember pausing the TV when that happened just to make sure it wasn't in my <laughs> It head. wasn't your tinnitus. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, Do I have tinnitus? Am I, am I about to die? <laughs> is a witch well? cursing me right now somewhere <laughs> in New England? Like, what's happening? And one last point about details. You mentioned the license plate. Um, speaking mm-hmm. of the car, Stray Miles on Twitter, that is the, this person's username, mentions Hi, Miles. that Crowley drives a little bit slower when Aziraphale is with him. Oh. <laughs> and there's a screenshot of the speedometer, uh, <gasps> in both Not situations. the speedometer detail! And I Why just think I that's neat. I know, it's so sweet! <laughs> Oh my god. And that's the thing, there's little uh, things you like this. care about your person's, like, basic safety? Oh my god. There's little things like this all throughout the season that are so wonderful because over and over again, they're really showing us what Aziraphale and Crowley mean to each other as opposed to telling us. And I like that. I like that this show assumes its audience is smart enough to read into those things. Well, it's like the the detail of like him knowing like the tone of voice. This is like the something's happening or not like the oh, I just did something really cool and I need to tell you. Like I'm just oh like my God. the things you know about people. <laughs> like, Literally. Hello. Oh my gosh. It's like knowing somebody's coffee order. Um, you know, oh, it's so, so important. Intimate. It's ways not... to say I love you without ways saying I love you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. Again, <laughs> like I, no. I, I, I watched this show and then I remembered thinking, okay, yeah, that was fun and feeling like not indifferent, but like, yeah, I had a fun time. And now that we're yeah. talking about it and we're coming, we're bringing up all these things, I'm realizing yeah. how maddeningly uh, insane this is making me. So I'm right. glad, I'm glad that you feel the same way because as we're talking, I was just like, yeah, really, really, like I didn't hate the show at all. I just couldn't tell you what happened in it, but I had a great time. And like the more we talk about it, I'm like, I remember that detail. This is such, oh my God, this is a great show. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need to pay attention more. <laughs> what, what are some of the things that you're liking? I really loved the use of Jane Austen parallels isn't the right word, but like motifs, I guess, because when they're trying to get Nina and Maggie to like get together and I think it's Crowley who is like, oh, we should get like, have it be raining and then they'll confess or like one of them su- suggests this and immediately like when they start talking about like love confessions while it's raining I immediately thought of the Pride and Prejudice scene where he proposes for the first time in, in like the 2005 version I'm just like oh my god it's Pride and Prejudice and then Zirafel was like oh like we can talk about Jane Austen and I was like oh, yes Exactly. And then the fact that they like used her like where she has balls and everything. So they put on a ball to get these two people together. And then everyone's they're doing the dance from like, I'm pretty sure it's I mean, it's probably like a more well known like actual dance, but like it looked very similar to the dance that they do in the 2005 Pride and Prejudice. So like me, whose comfort movie is Pride and Prejudice was like, Wee! <laughs> so, the I just really like scene. Holy Jesus. When he's like, oh, we should dance. I was like, oh, the Tumblr Jesus, girl Mary, are going to love this. Jesus, Mary, They're and Joseph. They're going to love this. And they did. And they danced. Oh, my God. Um, how, did, how did that scene make you feel? So, I felt, it made me feel. <laughs> it sure did make me feel. <laughs> sure made me feel. <laughs> it sure did. Um, oh, my God. Uh, there's a great meta post on Tumblr going around right now by Words Inhaled. 
um, where they mention <laughs> <Great> that, <URL. laughs> that, yeah, that the dynamic between Crowley and Az over the last 6,000 years has been like a dance, you know? Uh-huh. They meet each other. They kind of like dance around this thing they have going on. They're never really talking about it, but it's being implied. And to see that kind of come to fruition through this dance, which where, Mm. mind you, I'm seeing a lot of interpretations of the hands where Crowley's hands are kind of leaning into and clutching as is more. Yeah. Yeah. um, Kind of... uh, Notice that immediately. (laughs) Hinting at where things are going to go. Like... Hands... (sighs) Hands. H space, A space, N space, D space, S. Hands. Hand acting. <laughs> uh, speaking of dances, though, I also loved that when they were talking about the, oh, I did a little, like, I was wrong, you were right, dance back in 16, this, whatever, it's your turn. And then there was, like, a literal dance that Crowley does. So, I was wrong, you were right. <laughs> so baby girl. Baby so, so ineffable husband coded. Um <laughs> Though it can't really be coded because they are. Um, <laughs> because they are. <laughs> they just are them. <laughs> so. No, but but you're so right. I feel like, first of all, to have someone like classic romantic author Jane Austen pay a, play a role mm-hmm. in a season that is all about love, um, love is so it. special. I hope that continues to be a theme that's intertwined into later seasons and episodes. Um, I hope I they get the kiss in the rain. hope. <gasps> Oh, they have to now. Oh, they have to now. Oh, they have to now. They the have to kiss made. in the rain. I thought you were going to go to anaphylactic shock for a second. Went, oh. oh, they have to like, now. Holy shit. Yeah. Oh, God. Because why even, why even say it? Why even say it if you're not going to do it? I'm just it's, saying. And, and the other piece of this for me is like in our what we do in the shadows reviews, which you should check out, by the way, if you've never seen them. We talk you about the significance of a 40-something-year-old man going to the beach <laughs> and having a beach day. Let's go um, to the beach, beach. And he's way older than 40. Yeah, and he's teenage girl coded. <laughs> like, we talk about the importance of that. But yeah. I think another classic theme that works is a ball. Like, we talked in a, an episode it's of our show ball. months ago about how, like, there need, we need to bring balls back. Oh, during our Jane Austen August? Yeah. Yes, during during Jane Austen August. We need to bring back balls. Bring back balls. Bring Bring back back balls. balls. Bring back balls. balls. Bring back balls. balls. (laughs) Um, Uh, That will never get taken out of context. No, absolutely not. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And if it does, the double meaning, it, it works. I sign off on all the balls being brought back. Truly. I'm putting my name on that. I'm putting my branding on that, but I'm going to make a LinkedIn post about it. Uh, <laughs> the next day you'll be searching for jobs for some unrelated reason. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not the, the being fired uh, for my vocal support of the ball industry. <laughs> Was there anything else that re- you really liked Uh in these episodes no plot detail really because as i said before i wasn't quite sure what was happening but i knew i was having a good time but i think it's really funny when (laughs) david Tennant has to almost fight for using his actual scottish accent in whatever he's in (laughs) i think that's so funny it's like they look at this man and they go hey scottish man you're not allowed to speak (laughs) your actual (laughs) accent and has to put on like a british accent for everything he does they did it to him in doctor who um mm-hmm. they did it to him here i think it's really funny that the one show i watched with him in it where he didn't have to hide it was the fucking broad church of all shows <laughs> are you thinking what i'm thinking uh, am i bloody twitter <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work anymore it doesn't work anymore I am never going to call it X. No. Oh, my God. It's Twitter. God. It's Twitter, but stupid. Which it is the... Always been. I mean, every day, this guy is like, what if I prove to you that I was a cartoon villain? Did you see that, like, he used something like Tesla money or something like that to build a glass house? No. No. No, but... I don't know if uh, you've seen Glass Onion, but... <laughs> I was gonna, everything that I know about this man, I've learned against my will, but whenever I learn something new... I'm like, I believe you. I'm not even going to look it up. I believe you. (laughs) If you told me that Elon Musk walked out onto the street, pulled a bunch of diamonds out of a Birkin bag, and tossed them at people, (laughs) 
I believe you. I would believe you. Yeah. If you told me Elon Musk was on the Titan submarine, I'd celebrate, but then I'd believe you. <laughs> <laughs> there's no there's no world where you could tell me something about this man and I wouldn't believe you. And if you told me something unbelievable, if you were like, oh, no, he just gave it all to charity. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he's doing it for global warming. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he gave all his money to the poor. I would I would squint my little eyes and I'd be like, what <laughs> is the arc? What's the scheme? I don't know. But what I do know is that we're letting David Tennant be a little Scottish for at least one episode. <laughs> <laughs> and he went full Scottish. And I love it so much. And again, I just, I just think it's really funny that this man is never allowed to use his actual accent. And I think what's even funnier is that in Doctor Who, he wasn't allowed except for one episode. And then, like, years later, they cast Peter Capaldi as the Doctor. And he's <laughs> and allowed like, to be Scottish. You want, babe. And at one point, he has, like, this silly American accent. Which is oh cute. yeah, that was funny. <laughs> that was so funny. That was such a married couple moment. Oh my god, yeah, where he's role playing uh, an American hiring a magician, and like I liked that he supported him, but it was also like enough to be like, okay, you know this isn't your thing, right? Like I support <laughs> you. We're gonna do this, but you shouldn't make a career out of this. And I'm saying this because I love you. <laughs> like, That's literally you, you and not me. Be a magician with any choice I've ever made in my life. Um, <laughs> just like. Okay, you can do that, but don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. Sleep on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I sure won't. And I don't sleep at all. For, <laughs> and she doesn't sleep. For days on end. Okay, you were talking about details earlier, but tell yeah. me about the, like, what are your thoughts on the visuals of the show? Uh, <laughs> I, oh, <laughs> she I love them. I love <laughs> <laughs> they make me positively carnal um the scene in the pub in episode two uh mm -hmm. is something that will be sticking with me for a very long time and yeah. the things that happen in this scene like there's i don't know if there's anything notable beyond just the boys sitting down as they do as is their practice to have a cuppa and i can't i didn't mean that i meant that ironically but now i think people are gonna think i meant that <laughs> completely authentically you're like the okay. um, friend who like travels abroad for like a week and you come back with a slight accent <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah a cuppa <laughs> but no like the show is so visually compelling and in that scene yeah even though there's nothing substantial happening it's so romantic because there's such soft lighting Curly is wearing a turtleneck. He <laughs> is this the scene? Is this the scene? Is this the scene where Aziraphale <laughs> like takes his hand and puts it on Curly's chest and literally like drags it down? <laughs> Sorry, is this the scene? That's me being a woman all the time. <laughs> Completely correcting my tone. Yeah, I yeah, I loved it. <laughs> That's all I remember about that scene. To be honest. It's like, I feel like I just watched you type an email and then delete the exclamation point at the end of it. <laughs> Me at work every day. <laughs> no, but it, it is that scene. It is. Oh my God. The eroticness of that. It's the tension. It's so palpable. Yeah. You can cut it with a knife. I feel like that's going to be one of the most striking scenes from the season for me because of the light is diffused across their because faces. The it really softens okay. their features. Um, and I think that works because at this point of the episode, we are technically seeing them sit down for this practice they have where they kind of do communion together every so often, but then it doesn't work out because there's mm. trouble afoot. And that I think is great too, because it shows how they're already kind of mismatching and things are already kind of falling apart, apart between them. Like they're mm. still not talking at this point, but there is this light between them, this, this love and warmth, Aww. but it's, it's being diffused by the situation. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh oh. I think the listeners are probably watching us hyperfixate in real time on this show. Because sometimes uh. it happens. Sometimes you watch something and you're like, oh yeah, that was fun. And then you see a post or, or, or you like talk about it with someone and you're like, oh, I'm actually down bad. <laughs> yeah. Down the more bad. I think about this, the more I would like to retract my opening statements. <laughs> About how I was like, yeah, it was a bit intentional, but like, it was a good show. It was a fun time. And I think that's how we're going to have to sell this one is like, this is literally our descent into madness where we begin in casual indifference and we slowly uh, <laughs> take on Edward Allan Poe levels of Edward Allan Poe? <laughs> no, no, cut that, cut that. 
that. <laughs> Edward as an English major. <laughs> I think he would have started. to make it about this show again but like we haven't had our flag means death in like <laughs> over a year now and that is our show that's the show yeah. and i feel like this is how i felt in like <laughs> since like march of 2022 and it's kind of dissipated a little bit except for when we bring it up and we talk about it and i go insane again and that's why like talking about this show and be like yeah i'm a casual fan and then like the more we talk about it the more i'm like no i'm fucking not <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a liar, but mostly to myself. I, I, one thing about us is that we will lie to ourselves to protect our emotional states. If you Otherwise, me. we'll start crying on the podcast or saying things like Edward Allen Poe. If you heard me, if you heard that that uh, mechanical <laughs> noise, that was me falling out of my chair. She straight up like <laughs> fell out of her chair onto the floor. It's people are gonna listen to this and be like, "This is not fucking funny." You two are just. <laughs> Oh, gone. Um, but you know what? There's an audience out there who's going to be like, this is what I sound like on a daily basis, and those are my people. <laughs> to those of you who are also insane, this is for you. <laughs> I see you. I hear you. I am also crying. We're going to get through this together. <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. Well, that was my laugh for the year. That was great, everyone. Um <laughs> But, like, no, I feel like we literally do ascend into hysteria um, in real time when we talk about these shows. And I'm glad for it. I really yeah, am. It's so it's much such fun. a blessing. It's such a blessing to feel about television. Am I right? So it's such a great thing to have people creating things that provoke <laughs> this behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Well, like, we were talking earlier about how this show is, like, such like a warm hug and it reminds us a lot of Doctor Who and how like we would watch that show growing up and I feel like this is the closest I've felt to that time where oh. we were just absolutely insane and also in high school and now we're just like absolutely insane but have adult jobs. It, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> the only thing that changes is where we are in the <laughs> It's 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 great because it does feel like we are in the golden age of fun shows. Like it is. There's so many fun shows nowadays. It's easy to focus on the bad, you know. It's easy to focus mm -hmm. on the Amazon Prime Cinderellas of the world. But stop bringing that up. Stop. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> it's. A, I edited a clip for that last night, and now it's there. Stop. It's stuck. It's really stuck. But that's my point, right? Is like it's nice to be able to focus on some very memorable and thoughtful television. I know we had a conversation a while back about how like, okay, Succession does feel like the end of maybe, maybe possibly the end of the golden age of television more generally, which I understand because it, it, it is really genuinely one in a million in terms mm -hmm. of um, prestige television shows. But like, I think there are still crumbs, you know? And this show is a crumb. I think also, not every show needs to be a work of art in the sense of like it doesn't need to be realistic or drama or like you say like prestige shows you can have the fun silly quirky times and it <laughs> still get the attention it deserves actually like my aunt and I were just talking about this about like movies that get nominated for Oscars they're all like the super serious like dramatic ones but like then you have <laughs> the example used was Twilight that has as many followers and viewers like why are the Oscars all movies that 
truly like the general public hasn't actually heard of or watched mm. like why doesn't the fun time movies get as much attention to it yeah and i think and that's the thing is i think succession is one of the rare instances that uh, represents a crossover of the general public's viewing tendencies and prestige television, but that doesn't mm-hmm. happen a lot, right? And right. and and so it is it is like an outlier. And meanwhile, shows like Good Omens and uh, What We Do in the Shadows, like those are shows that I think the public very clearly loves and values, and yet you don't see them get the same credit from the Academy, which is is displeasing. But you know what? That's what you and I are here for to talk about and hopefully shed light on. Uh, we gotta pick up the slack. <laughs> yeah, we gotta. <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. I'm gonna, get up. I'm gonna pick up the slack for the fucking Academy. <laughs> no wonder everyone is fucking striking. Support SAG after the WGA. Last thing in terms of praise. I love the continued gag of ineffable bureaucracy. I mm, love yep. it. As someone who works in a nonprofit who works for the government. It, it's so funny to me. Like in episode two, when they're talking with Job's kids and Crowley is bringing Hellfire, uh, one of the kids says, can you save us? And Aziraphale says, he has a permit, I'm afraid. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, that was so good. The bit of heaven and hell having agreements and procedures for wrath bringing is so It's so funny. funny. It's a bit, it will never get old. It'll never get old. Like, sorry, them's the rules, you know? (laughs) Yeah, literally. Like, if there was a scene of an angel at a front desk, which is exactly what happens in the show, and that angel said, oh, I'm going to have to send this up the pipeline, Um, just just checking in, just just following up, just looping back, that would be funny to me. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's such, I mean, it's such a human thing. And that's what's so silly about that dynamic with heaven and hell and humans is, like, they see, it seems like folks in heaven and hell don't fully understand humans and, like, a lot of their tendencies. And yet, they have done the most human thing of all, and that's create an inefficient system <laughs> right. to run things. <laughs> and it's funny that that's the human thing that they pick up on is, like, yeah. the work, like, aspect of everything, but not, like, the enjoying music or loving somebody. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And, and this is why I contradict myself because it is also the most inhumane thing about humans that we build these systems without that are not person centered, that are not human centered. Right. So there's like this great irony to that, and it, it it works so well with the central conflict of this of the season between Az and Crowley, and their foils Gabriel and Beelzebub, because this is what's driving them apart. In part, is the bureaucracy and their conflicting interpretations about how to cope within it how to be together Mm -hmm. and be within it (laughs) (laughs) sorry i don't know why (laughs) that was my commentary (laughs) and you were right (laughs) and she was right for that (laughs) did you know that um the guy who played Eamon is david Tennant's son like the eldest son of job that's so believable wow that and that put so much in perspective because I was like damn he's he's bringing he's bringing he's giving and the guy playing Job was <laughs> I was about to say Pete Davidson but that's not right <laughs> what <laughs> but is, isn't it Peter Davidson hold on hold on um doc the young teenager who's a huge Doctor Who fan of me is yelling at me right now hold on sorry <laughs> <laughs> huh is Ethan Slater also going to be starring in Good Omens it's- I don't know who that is. Uh, the guy that she's rumored to have an affair with. She, who's she? Ariana. Oh my god! I didn't even tell. I didn't even set up the joke. Can, can you tell okay. that I'm also just like not up with pop culture at all? It is Peter Davison, and he is a uh, David Tennant's uh, father-in-law. So. Oh. Oh. I think okay. it's really funny that his son had to look at his grandpa and call him dad and also flirt with his dad's boyfriend. There's a lot. What a Tuesday, huh? Going on here, yeah. <laughs> Freud is typing. <laughs> Freud has entered the chat. <laughs> is there anything that... It's so funny. Like, why are we even... I don't even know why we're going to talk about this now. Was there anything 
that didn't work for you this season? I do really not good with words and also flashbacks. Episodes two through five to me were just full of a bunch of flashbacks, which I know were important to their character development and their relationship and everything. And like me, who's like freaking out over little things as we talk about it today, it's like kicking myself for not paying attention. But like, I promise I will go back and rewatch this show and give it the proper attention that it needs. But there were just so many times where I was just more interested in like the mystery of like why Gabriel's here and what's going on. And I felt mm. like we kept getting away from that in a way. And every time they flash back to like, here's something that happened in 60 AD or whatever. And it's <laughs> like, okay, well, this has, doesn't really have anything huge to do with what I'm concerned about so and that's where I would tune out and I also don't like the use of flashbacks every single episode I was more intrigued with what was happening on in the present and then and also with like their present relationship Mm -hmm. than I was with what happened years before we as an audience met them and I'm saying that because like I didn't watch the show for the relationship like I I love it I think it's great, I'll but it's one it. of, <laughs> but it's, it's one of those where like, I'll blog about it on Tumblr a little bit, but mm. then I'll just kind of move on. Uh-huh. Like I'll go insane when we talk about it, but it's not like it's going to, it's not a hyper fixation for me. Maybe I'll have to go back and rewatch it and pay more attention to like their relationship and like mm. what was happening and like the things that they did in the past that like come back more. And I've already seen like a couple parallel stuff on tumblr where i'm like oh i should have paid attention to that Mm. but it was a lot of jumping around that i think as far as this show goes for binging doesn't do well for me personally i think if this show was released week to week i would be way more obsessed with it than Mm. i currently am um which is just a casual clownery (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So because I watched it all in one sitting, it was a lot to digest and a lot that my little brain couldn't completely focus on. The the jumping around at times um, didn't help with that. I I agree with that. Well, first, I want to applaud the way you opened this critique, which was with the phrasing, I don't do well with words or (laughs) flashbacks. (laughs) 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 I, I don't know. I just couldn't picture you going on and being like, or colors, or shapes, <laughs> or colors. letters, or talking, <laughs> or speaking, breathing, or going uh, out into the sun. <laughs> I, I agree. You mentioned at one point earlier in the episode that you felt like this wasn't a show that you could stream. And I agree with that. You know, my, my uneducated opinion is that this is a show that I feel like deserves to be digested one episode at a time over time Um, right because I don't I don't know if people when they release shows all at once I don't know if they're worrying that by doing that the audience is going to get disengaged and, and stop watching I assume that's it but like I don't know me personally I feel like I would have been more engaged if I had time after each episode to digest it because the shows where I get to break things down week by week, I feel like I'm having a more meaningful connection with and watching experience with those shows. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. I completely agree. And it's not like just because they release it all at once doesn't mean you have to watch it all at once. Yeah. Like with season one, I I actually watched it with my family. Uh, We all watched it together. And Mm. we we as a collective don't binge stuff together. It's just when we have time to, when we're all together. So it was like almost a weekly thing. I was able to better comprehend season one because I wasn't watching it all in one sitting and I was going episode by episode and taking my time with it. But with this one, I was just like, no, I want to binge it so we can talk about it and do all this. And I think it was just like too much at once. Yeah. And I think it was almost, it's almost like a disservice in a way to the show because Mm -hmm. like you said, this show deserves to be like, have the time taken. Like if I had a week to process and like, analyze every little thing Mm -hmm. that happened in one episode again i would be absolutely obsessed with it yes uh this is a criticism i saw of of the bear season two's release as well is that um and and like the perspective on this was like if the show had been released episode by episode we would still be talking about it right now instead of only talking about it for like a week or so 
in the dead of summer. I thought that that show was a weekly show because it just felt like it it was it just felt like it was a weekly show mm-hmm. to me. And it's funny because when it first came out, I saw a lot of people talking about it Ooh. and then I didn't hear anyone talk about it after a while and I was just like, oh maybe it's just because it's off of my like Tumblr radar. Now that I know that it's all dropped at once, that makes way more sense. And I feel right. like that show from what I've heard about it is good enough to be weekly and sh- deserves the time spent talking about it for like at least a couple months. No, right. I think like going back to Succession, the collective experience of viewing Succession, like that was an event. That was yeah. a multi-month event and I mean, when it was over, there was almost kind of like a void that I think a lot of us were trying to fill in our lives, not to, not to sound too <laughs> dramatic, but like, and, and I feel like when you're week by week, when you have that routine of sharing in an experience with other people, it yeah. adds value. Yeah, because now you have to avoid spoilers because there are yeah. people who binge it all at once when it drops at midnight. And then there's people who wait, only give it the weekend to stop tagging things. And yeah. it's just like, I hate that because sometimes for most shows, I can't watch everything all at once. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wish that, <laughs> at least for like weekly episodes, like you just have to worry about, oh, well, if I missed it, I just missed one episode. Not right. like I have to binge eight episodes in one go. And like, that's not to say that there aren't shows that like work in the binging format. Like, I feel like I enjoyed what we do in the shadows more, for example, when I watched it, when I just binged it. And I got to like take a step back and look at the whole season as a whole. And I find that a lot with these 20 minute shows where it's like they work better together sometimes. Um, when you can see the whole piece, when you can see the whole season. Um, But I I totally agree. I think that was probably the one thing that was not working for me with this show. And uh, if I could do it again, if I knew better and I could do it again, Mm -hmm. I would definitely watch it episode by episode. Um, And maybe there's a chance to to revisit that um, once I forget everything, ultimately, (laughs) um, as does happen whenever I finish a show. One thing that will always work always work with this show is the dynamic between Crowley and Aziraphale. Oh, yes, 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 yes. They they just on screen together. Like, whenever they're, like, right next to each other, I'm, like, all in, eyes focused, not blinking. <laughs> like, no, real. Absolutely. They have such a presence. But, like, I, I would, another thought I had while I was watching this show was I love watching shows where there's a pair of people who are just, like, so well together. And every time, like, they're next to each other, you're like, yeah, it's them. Like, here they are. Oh. And it's, it's so... Oh. They have such a presence on screen. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm okay, boiling. Gale water waters. I'm boiling. <laughs> it looks so good on screen together. And I think what also helps is the costuming of, you know, Aziraphale's, like, basically all white outfit and Crowley's, like, dark, cool, you know, <laughs> swagger The Caitlyn's suntan feet dichotomy. Yeah, truly, truly. <laughs> it's one of our favorite dynamics, the the dark and light character, the sun and moon characters, mm. and the way they work together, the way they fit so well together, the way they complement yeah. each other and contrast um, in a way that is so compelling. When you talk about that dynamic in the wild, I would assume in this is wild. the example that you use. Um, just given the popularity and notoriety of this show, and yeah. I just think it's funny that you say when we talk about this show in the wild, as if, like, currently we're, like, (laughs) contained in a cage, which we should be, because listen to us, and that this show is our enrichment time. Listen, it's brutal out there by Olivia Rodrigo, and (laughs) sometimes when you leave the house, having conversations about your shows normally can feel like uh being in the lines exhibit at the zoo and you have to restrain yourself like my boss right now is watching succession and she watches it very differently than how i watched it and i have to be very normal and watch myself with how i go so what did you think (laughs) (laughs) oh cool yeah yeah mm -hmm. very normal very cool you're you're like gripping your desk like your face is bright red you're sweating you're like i need (laughs) to tell someone here about how baby girl coded kendall roy is and literally can't because they would she'd be like what who she she would be like there's something wrong with you and i'd be like yeah 
please please don't fire me <laughs> correct and that's the point there's a couple notable dynamics um in this episode that i wanted to raise with you for yes reactionary purposes i guess um but yeah, just just just, 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 just see what to fuck up your life even more <laughs> please do conducting an experience. Yeah, i got nothing going on <laughs> uh, when when crowley oh when crowley calls aziraphale angel ah ah <laughs> It's so he's literally one, but it's such a, a great in term of endearment. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> and then and then for uh, Nina and Maggie that are kind of sort of their foils, or maybe their foils to Gabriel and Beelzebub. When at the end of the episode, uh, Nina and Maggie are talking with Crowley about his feelings for Az, uh, mm. and Nina calls Maggie Angel as a term of endearment. Oh, it's such a great oh, full circle moment. I missed that. I missed that one. Uh, oh, uh, oh. <laughs> I'm not crying on the podcast. I'm not crying on the podcast. I am crying on the podcast, but I'm not crying on the podcast. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, wish, I wish we were filming this episode so that I could just make a compilation of all of your faces when I mentioned something you didn't notice. There's part of me that's just like, damn, I really wish we were filming these episodes. But then, like, I think it's very good for me because when I look insane and no one needs to see that but you. And two, it's just I'm too lazy to edit the audio and the visual, you know? <laughs> She's gatekeeping her visual insanity. Notice that I distinguish it. It's, it's merely visual. Um, <laughs> because the verbal insanity is... Uh, it's out there. It's, the closet is glass. The closet is glass. <laughs> Eventually we'll have a Patreon that if you really want to see the insanity, you pay me for it at least. <laughs> <laughs> there's that. And then there's another dynamic, which she I know said we've casually. been talking about for years. Years literally because we've had this show now for years. Um, <laughs> and that's the years. <laughs> 6,000 of them. Oh ah! my god, what a oh, slow between... burn. Oh, 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 yeah. You mean like the literal 6,000 years between them, not the 6,000 years it's felt like between some of the seasons. <laughs> yeah, no, literally, yeah, no, like, yeah. yeah. But there's so much tension there because of this dance they're doing. And I didn't credit it earlier, so I want to take this moment to credit that the, the person that brought up the dance and, and the pattern of the dance is, fuck mm-hmm. yeah, I saw that on Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> but great URL. Like 6,000 years fun. Of dancing around the truth, uh, the opportunity is to talk is so insane, crazy. Like it's one thing to like literally like like dance around things with people in your real life and be like, uh-huh. oh, we're not talking about this. We're not like like we both know, but we're not saying anything. And the stress that comes with that. But for six thousand years, and I think it's. I think it's crazy that it's Crowley who finally says the things and it's, not Aziraphale. It's so good! It's so good! Yeah! <laughs> it's so... Listen. Listen to me, okay? Listen here, fellas. I'm listening! I love when the more emotionally repressed person is the person to make the first move. Um, Hell, yeah. I'm snorting that. I'm injecting that. That is... So good. Um, Into my veins. And it's not just, I mean, it's not just that it's him. It's the things he says, like the, the language choices he makes. Um, yep. Yep. It, in that final scene, um, no nightingales. Oh, shh. Sh- 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 uh, 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 <laughs> that's all. That's all. Um, uh, it could have been us. We could, we have, could have been, been us. us. Ah, that hey. hurts. That was one of those where I was like, "Oh, don't do, don't say that." Hey, now, don't say that. Oh, You're a rock no. star. I uh, every every girly who's ever made a playlist in her life is <clears throat> uh, titling her her ship playlist for them that as we speak. Truly, I'm sure there's one already. Whoa. Um, that kind of reminds me of this post that I literally just saw that says. 
I love how the whole season seems silly and like there's not much plot and then all of a sudden with less than 20 minutes remaining the central relationship which is integral to the whole thing is threatened then in rapid succession shaken turned on its head and destroyed like driving down a boring commercial strip in anywhere USA and suddenly having a meteor half the Pacific Ocean and a million knives dropped in your car and the best part is when you rewatch you realize the signs of this impending cataclysm were there all along you just couldn't see them yet and then there's a quote that says and it's from the show it's always too late. Oh. Ah, guess who's crying on the podcast? It's not me. It's not me this time. It's not. It's not me either. I'm laughing. I, oh, you're laughing. Everything happened in the last 20 minutes and you're laughing. Well, because the whole time <laughs> you were talking, it made me think about um, that. Uh, God, it has to be a vine, uh, but it's used a lot in like random compilations of like funny stuff. And it's the, oh, no, we got to go. Um, which is exactly <laughs> oh, what no, I imagined go. Neil Gaiman saying when he realized that he had to had to add some substance to the final episode. <laughs> I feel like that really validates my earlier comments of like I feel like nothing happened until like the last episode because like that's where everything started happening and mm-hmm. the last twenty minutes was where I was most engaged because it was them on yes. screen and there was trouble happening and I was like, Oh my god, are they gonna go there? Are they gonna do it? Yeah. And it's just interesting to me because, like, immediately I got the feeling that I'm like they're gonna do they're gonna move their relationship forward somehow yeah. because they're gonna feed us in the first dinner! scene. <laughs> girl dinner, <laughs> girl dinner. <laughs> but like in the first scene, I can't remember the exact quote, but Quole is just like, "Oh, look at you! Aren't you beautiful?" And then Aziraphale looks at him like. <gasps> me but he's not talking about him he's talking about like the universe that he just created but i'm just mm. like oh they're gonna go there because and throughout the entire season you see aziraphale look at crowley in so many different like soft ways and like the flirting that happens the pining that's happening and for it to not be aziraphale who comes to the conclusion of like yeah let's talk about our feelings was incredible the eye acting between them i mean oh i was fully enamored by Every scene where they were looking at each other this entire season. Yeah. Up until the very end. And I, I think the choice, uh, calling back to our discussion about music, for there to be virtually none when yes. when Crowley wears his heart on his sleeve uh, yeah. is so, I mean, it's insane. It's one of my favorite things when you take that element away and mm-hmm. let the viewer listen to what's being said and really feel it and live in the intensity of that moment because in Mm -hmm. real life there wouldn't be music yeah yeah and I think that's like when they take away music in situations like that it makes it feel all the more real because like you don't get that in real life like you said and I think what adds to it too is the music played throughout this show is usually silly fun quirky like like it literally there was a point where John Hamm as Gabriel has a duster and he like shakes it back and forth and the music goes twinkle 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 mm. <laughs> and it just it's just fun the music is aware of the action that is being played on oh. screen and is playing to it and I think that's such a cool detail and I think oh. this show does it so well of like things going to music and like the music literally being orchestrated to the visuals and mm-hmm. for there to be none until the kiss <laughs> yep. Yep. is a lot what was your reaction to it? Let's talk about that. I feel damned to hell, literally, by it. <laughs> I do. I feel, I feel like Neil Gaiman came into my room at night, sprinkled, using that same sound, the tinkle, 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 tinkle. Uh, night terrors all of my body, and expecting <laughs> me to live like that for the next four years. The intensity between them coming to a head in the last 20 minutes is heartbreaking in part because there was an expectation for many people going into this season and given how long it's been since this show first aired that there would be a happy ending for them um right but i almost like that the timeline nearly mimics as you kind of hinted to earlier um how long these two beings have waited to be together like yeah because the first season feels like it's a thousand years ago it is really the ultimate slow burn um Mm -hmm. To, really though. to deliver us that desperation from Crowley in the last few minutes of the season. I mean, it's it's heartbreaking and it's unexpected, uh, mm-hmm. maybe for many of us. 
but I think it I do think it holds up and I think it will when we get to season three and I think that if they just immediately like got together or like the confession happened and it all worked out I feel like that would almost be too easy especially Mm -hmm. given like how long this has been going on and also that Aziraphale is clearly not in like he's not ready yeah even like even if he wants it like he he still needs to like basically cut loose from heaven yes (laughs) and or at least like see what he's doing now and like he says to Crowley like I can make it better and I think maybe he could Mm. And it's just that they're both in different headspaces right now, and mm-hmm. Crowley needs to get this out on the table, where Aziraphale wasn't ready to put that all out on the table. Mm-hmm. And it feels more, in this sci-fi fun fantasy show, it feels more realistic yeah, in a way to where, like, when they eventually do, it's going to pay off even more. Like, it's going to feel more satisfying. Like, the way it's rough out there, folks, but <laughs> I like it. I very much like it. Yeah, it is more realistic. And another reason I think it holds is because this show is, in addition to being about the ineffable husbands and also, you know, complementary to their dynamic about bureaucracy and about Mm -hmm. the way that systems hold us back from our truths. Um, But in a way, and I want to acknowledge this because I think it's great, in a way that isn't overtly about the coming out aspect of queerness. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone on Tumblr, another great handle, Medusa's daughter. <laughs> yeah! Uh, oh, I love that. Uh, they say that the fact that everyone is gay, and I'm paraphrasing, and no one cares is such a based way to run a show. Um, yeah. That's, like, so spot on, because this could have been another one of those shows where it's, like, it's about the repressed feelings, but in a way that is tied to the homophobia of the system um Mm -hmm. and one could maybe read it that way but it seems like in this dynamic there is there's queerness it's there it's established but then there's also the bureaucratic elements that more generally keep us from being ourselves and from Mm -hmm. living authentically and that's what makes uh we could have been us so sad and the differing interpretations that each man has of how to get there so i think they need this i think they need this breakup to work through these things because um, as somebody pointed out uh on tumblr they're having the same fights that they were last season they're that that same and and not and, and they haven't confronted it really to this extent um until this point and that fight is always essentially like how do we work within or without of this system together and for the good of these humans that we love and for ourselves and each other so yeah ow you know like damn (laughs) ow (laughs) jeez if i had a nickel for every time i watched a show Mm. and two people who were in a relationship romantic or otherwise, were separated or left each other. At the end of a season, I would have three nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened thrice. It has happened. It's definitely happened more than thrice in the gay community. It's definitely happened more than thrice. (laughs) (laughs) We are out here uh, being doomed by the narrative every single day. Um, I'm so sorry. (laughs) Okay, yeah. Well, to wrap things up, maybe we can talk a little bit about the comparisons that people are drawing to our flag means death and if people haven't watched that yet and don't want to be spoiled this is probably the time to tune out sayonara get out there have been a lot of comparisons drawn to the the dynamic between steed and ed and that is another situation Mm -hmm. where it does seem like both men had to go off and do their own growing to realize the value they hold in each other's lives and what hurdles they needed to jump over to be together um which we'll probably hopefully learn more about in october uh, <laughs> October, October, it's only a couple of months away. So, I don't know. I do think, I, I think there's like, it's it's interesting that it's happened twice. I don't yeah. think that that was intentional because this show has probably, was, was probably scripted over two years ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you think Neil Gaiman watched Our Fly Means Death and was like, shit. <laughs> I think he watched Fuck. it. 
And then he texted David Jenkins because he just has his number. Yeah. And he's just like... In our world. They, like, maniacally laugh together. We're like, let's destroy... He's like, guess what I did in my show? And David Jenkins is like, that's the good stuff. <laughs> they said the mental health industry needs a little boost. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, and that's exciting because... Maybe when Our Flag Means Death comes back, we can talk a little more about the similarities between these shows and how those dynamics intermingle. Sorry, I'm just thinking about having new content from that <laughs> show in particular. It's going to be so fun to talk about. I'm... There's going to be new images. Uh, it's August. We could get a trailer. I'm just saying. Anytime now. Any day. There's going to any... be a trailer. Any day. Well, Caitlin, it was a pleasure to talk with you about... <laughs> Why are you so Caitlin? formal? We've known each other for like 15 plus years. Well, Caitlin, it was a pleasure having you here. I actually just emailed Caitlin <laughs> my resume. <laughs> there was no Most cover letter things. attached, so we, we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, but thank you for taking the time <laughs> for coming in and interviewing. Um, it was nice. <laughs> We actually didn't get your resume because it went through our AI system yes. and um, you didn't copy and paste the job description in small white lettering <laughs> <laughs> to the bottom corner of the header. So we will not we be, will seeing, not be you seeing you again. You. <laughs> but yeah, uh, well, it's been great. Um, I love talking about this with you and realizing that I loved the show even more than I thought I did. <laughs> it was a pleasure to descend into madness yeah, with you. As, as always. always. As always. We are in the middle of descending into madness about what we do in the shadows oh, well, as well yeah, we so are. if you want to go and check out that series we are reviewing each episode week by week as they air every monday, so you're getting our immediate baby, reactions new to that episodes show. every monday we'll also be as we said we'll be talking about our flag means death season two and that comes out in october so if you're just learning that now it's october baby uh that's coming <laughs> out october. we've also reviewed season one of that which you can actually go watch us descend into madness on youtube you can follow us on tiktok on instagram on tumblr that is it bye, bye! <laughs>